What's going on, YouTube? Bryce Crispy 94 here, joined by the one and only Cryoquake. What's going on, everybody? Cryo here, and boy, oh boy, do we finally have the one that we promised to do. <laughs> yes. A month late, but it was Halloween. Had to do spooky. That is true. That is true. And it was definitely a very good one, so you should go check it out if you haven't already. You should, yes. Um, so, as promised a month ago, we have the Aarakocka. Oh. Hold on. There we have the Aarakocka. My uh, slide was not cooperating. So, this is the ugly ass first edition Aarakocka. What do you mean? He's beautiful. The, okay, this thing. It. I think it was a children's cartoon. I don't know. It was a cartoon I watched when I was younger, and it had these like bird people that were just. I always found them really grotesque, and that's what this is, looks like. Because they're, like, hunched over. They have, like, the arm wings, and they're just not very flattering to look at. Like, Yeah, no, I don't think they I are. I can't remember the name of that cartoon, but... I mean, and at this point, they were monsters only, right? I believe so. You know, I don't actually know when they became a playable race. Because the way that it's drawn think leads it to maybe be... three point five. That would make sense. Because the way it's drawn would lead me to believe that it's a monster rather than a race. yeah. Like there's not really much about this. Um, but yeah, it's your typical first edition art, um, black and white, kind of crudely drawn, but just to give you an imagination. Very. Um, we'll say that... What's it? What's the word? Very like caveman esque drawing. Like a very yeah. like. Um, like, ah, what's the word? Like, if you were to, like, find an old book in your library about, like, creatures that died a long time ago, this would be, like, the very, like, standardized picture, I feel. Right. I feel like a lot of first edition art works like that. It's, like, very, um, you see it, and then it was, I feel like it was drawn for the imagination. Yeah. Like, here's your basis, build upon that. Yeah. Very, like, mythical in a way mm -hmm. so then we move to second edition oh, where wow. not much has changed it's just colorized it, yeah it got colorized huh it's and it's a little creepier though somehow right it's just, there's something about it i think it's the football shoulder pads it but that goes back to like the hunchness of it it's all yeah i guess <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. it's like one solid color, which kind of upsets me. Like, even though yeah, legs... like they really didn't they didn't really try with it. I mean, it's okay. But, uh, it's definitely starting to look more like bird-like because the first one kind of right? looks like it could be like I don't know. The beak looks a little more like a monkey nose. Kind of does. Um, I did learn. They are more, like, technically, Aarakocker are based off eagles and parrots. Interesting. Right? I know, like, a lot of people, like, will homebrew. I don't know. I didn't consider it homebrew until I learned that fact. But basically, they will homebrew to where it's like, you know, well, you have the hummingbird, Aarakocker. Yeah, I was going to mention that uh, down yeah, the line. So, like, yeah, that's technically kind of a homebrew Aarakocker. Yeah. Straight up D and D lore is they resemble parrots and eagles. And a long and for a long, long, long time, uh, people were doing homebrew Aarakocra owls. Yeah. Before the owl and thing. Now we have owls. Because yeah. yeah, crazily enough, we've been playing this game long enough that right around when I introduced Rice and Torchic and everybody to D and D, owlins didn't exist yet. Um, yeah, they did not. And so it was, like... it was all like homebrew stuff, and um, you know, like I said, like I have an NPC which we'll get into. Uh, that is uh, Aarakocra, that I introduced very early on. Um, very early. And so, yeah, a lot of... And it doesn't make a mechanical difference, right? They all are birds, and they all have the same stats. Right. But um, visually, yeah, uh, most of the time you see eagles and, yeah, uh, parrots I didn't know, but I, I definitely know that most of it, it's supposed to be based around an eagle. Well, so when you take a look at the third edition art, you really see the parrot. Oh, uh, well, there you go. Yeah, that's yeah. sick. Oh. That's so cool looking. <laughs> yeah. So, and like, 
You see it with the javelin, which I'll get into that when we talk about its origin and history, but uh, very colorful for third edition, um, parrot-like. And if you've noticed, like, their arms and wings are one aren't separate yet. Yeah. yeah. Which I've always, I, honestly, I used, for a long time, I used to think that's how it was for her 5e. Um, um, I believe that's how the bird race that Matt Mercer has is. Uh, I think so, yes. The one that uh, Travis played during Calamity? Yeah, I'm not sure though, because he used... He used. Yeah, I can't remember. He used axes, which I think would be hard. See, the thing with this, yeah. the thing with this is uh, this specific like rendition of how arakakras are is it would make them. It would make. I mean, obviously, this is holding a, a javelin with a foot, but it would be very difficult right. to play like a melee arakakra if this is how the rules uh, dubbed it. Right. Um, and see, that's why I, I don't know that they were a playable race in third edition. I saw 3.5 rules for them, but I don't know if they were homebrew or not. Yeah, I'm not sure. And maybe that's why, because they weren't, because of the fact that they right. were yeah. like this, and it would be, it would make it very difficult. There's still a monstrous race here. Mm -hmm. But you at least get to see it in more than one shade of, or yeah, more than one shade of red. Oh yeah, and it's beautiful it looking. yellows and oranges. Yeah, very parrot-like. So then we move on to the basic monster manual art from fifth edition where his wings and arms are separated he's wearing that kind of white armor still got like the spear uh very evil like yes extremely extremely evil and i'm glad they yes, didn't mother. i'm glad they didn't give it the like red and blue armor or else people would just call this fucking america bird um, right. because it is very much so like if you were to just take the face uh, you just, someone would put it on a fucking army poster <laughs> you know I mean, they almost could with that green. You slap a white star on that thing's chest. Yeah, it's fucking Captain America bird. Yep, but uh, I like fifth edition. Um, this is not my favorite fifth edition artwork. I have some other fifth edition artwork uh, in a couple of the other slides that I much prefer. But since this is the monster manual, yeah, artwork decided to uh, slap it here for our design discussion. It is a little basic, it, you know, it, like, I mean, go, moving from 3rd edition, I mean, once you hit 3rd edition, like, you're going to go downhill every time you try, I, I think. Right. Uh, but I think, like, with 5th edition's whole agenda, they wanted to streamline D&D, and they wanted to make it more accessible and easier to, like, grasp. And so by just putting a very bland blanket race for the bird, being like, this is, this is what you get. I, you know? I also feel like this design was designed in mind with this becoming a playable race. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the move to separate arms from wings had to have been intentional. Um, you know, because now, like, you know, rogue builds are viable, you know, because now you can fly mm -hmm. and try to get sneak attack that way. You know, barbarian builds are now viable because you can actually hold an axe and also fly. So, like, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that you make a good point that they they needed to they just needed to streamline it um, right. and make it easier to grasp a concept because if, if it would have had the rules of like, yes, it's wings and arms are one, there would be a lot less people who would play it because it would be too complicated. Um, and I think the whole point with 5e was to to make more people play it because like, hey, it's easy. So I think that was kind of the goal. But yeah, I, I definitely think that they knew i mean looking at the like entry from the aarakocra page it's talking about the enemies of elemental evil the summoning of the air elementals and as we know this thing first showed up as a playable race in the elemental evil uh story princes of the apocalypse exactly so very cool um did you notice that there was no fourth edition i did i did i thought that was yeah. very interesting i thought that was yeah I could not find one. Um, Forgotten Realms doesn't have an image of one. Hmm. So I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go with there was no 4th edition Eric. They needed a lot of time to figure out how to make it work. Right. All right. So now moving on to origin and history. So as you can see, here is another uh, rendition of 5th edition Eric Opera artwork. And this is my favorite. Yeah, this one's really good. 
This is from Tome of Annihilation because the Aarakocras play a decent role in uh, that book. Mm -hmm. Though, yeah, they were playable characters at that time. I had to look up at my shelf and see, okay, if it came out there, that book's there. <laughs> uh, so, basically, they are kind of a... I don't want to say a nomadic, because I believe nomadic implies they move. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in theory you could still attribute, like, the nomad lifestyle, because maybe they they have one place, but they they individually you know, travel a lot. Right. Um, um, so, because like the term nomad is just someone who travels. So right, but yeah. their their civilizations are really cool. Um, they basically live in giant bird nests, mm -hmm. but with like walls, but no ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really cool. It's made of like vines and straw. Um, they typically wear you know lighter outfits. Obviously, like if you wear medium or heavy armor as an aircraft, you can't fly. So. Mm -hmm. That goes right along with that. Um, fighting style, you'll see a lot of them wielding spears. That is like their number one weapon is spears and javelins. Uh, not really much for sword play, or and they definitely don't use shields, mm -hmm. which I thought was cool. I think I read um, somewhere because uh, this was, I mean, and we've talked about this a little bit, I think. So I play an Aarakocra, and we'll get into that. But I was reading about how shields and Aarakocra and their dynamic. And I think I remember reading somewhere that, like, they don't like to use shields because of, there's, like, a reason for it. I, I want to say it's because, like, if they're not using it, they don't have a really good place to put it because their back is, like, preoccupied right, by yeah. their wings. So I think that was the reason. I'm, I'm not sure. But I remember there being, like, an actual, like, explanation for why they don't really like shields. I can see that. So. Um, another interesting thing I learned. So this Aarakocra is very colorful. Mm -hmm. It is a male. Yes, I learned that too. I, so I believe the monster manual art being white and brown is probably female. Mm -hmm. I And I learned, fun fact, I learned this a while back thanks to Pokemon Black and White with Unpheasant. If you all know what ah, I'm talking yes. about with the male and female version. The female version is the dull look looking one and the male version is the one with the pink mask. Um... That's uh, that's like a thing for birds. Yeah, and I, I thought that it was one of the most interesting things I'd ever seen, that like males are the most colorful ones so that they can attract mate. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's like uh, peacocks, you know? Yeah. The male peacocks are the ones with the giant pretty fe feathers. I just think that's super interesting, like, like that, you know, you would think like, oh, look at this colorful pretty bird. It's got to be a female. And it's like, nope. Nope. Most of the time, yes, most of the time female birds are actually very boring to look at. Yeah. Um, which is hilarious because, you know. Yeah, they're just like, they're dull. Yeah, but yeah, I think that's super interesting, which actually also plays another part into my character, which we'll talk about too when we get there. So, uh, that's really it on there. Or there's no, like, definitive origin point for these guys. They just kind of, they started out definitely as um, a prehistoric race. I think it was called, like, the Era or something like that. Mm hmm. And at, over time, they developed into Air Cochran. Uh, they settled in mountains, uh, the jungles of Cholt, a um, bunch of other places. Again, uh, a lot of their history can be found in Prince of the Apocalypse, uh, along with its player companion. So I don't really want to spoil anything from that book, but it deals a lot with them. <laughs> so moving on to our wonderful stat block with the third image of the Aarakocra, which I believe is the image from Mordenkainen's Multiverse. Multiverse. I think so yeah. too, yeah, because that's the one that I've seen the most recently, which right. is yes. which would imply that it's because it's the, the new race, or the, the yeah. revamp, or whatever they call it nowadays. Right. Yeah. I, don't know, actually, I just... I guess the race, because the old race is technically legacy. Which is hilarious because, if I'm not mistaken, I think the stat block you have up is from the original. The, it, so, it is the monster stat block. Oh, you're right. It's the monster stat block. Yeah. Which did not change. Which is interesting because, yes. as we get to it, and I'm skipping a little bit ahead, in the language section, you get Eric Cocker and Orin. Um, with, with multiverse... When you pick Aarakocra as a race, um, Aarakocra, yeah, Aarakocra and Orin are 
removed. The, the languages themselves are yeah. actually just like not there as options, which really sucks. Um, because I used to think that was awesome because like air cocker makes the most sense, and Orin is literally like the language of fucking air elementals, which is awesome. Um, all of them are gone, I think. Orin, Terran, Aquin, and yeah, Ignan. Uh, there's a. They were, which is weird because, you know, everything's if. I'm gonna rant a little bit mm -hmm. about D and D one or whatever it's called, one D and D. And everything is supposed to be backwards compatible yet they do little things like that that kind of cut it out yeah like i when i made my character i, I my character technically I'm, and my dm was was lenient enough to help me kind of rework that stuff um but like yeah technically speaking per rules my eric cocker doesn't speak eric cocker nor Orin. um right which i think is interesting but like i you know i just i don't think it makes a whole lot of sense my only thing to think about it making sense is this one D&D is now taking place many years after 5th edition took place. Like, I'm talking in-game years, mm -hmm. you know. And so these races have maybe lost their their native languages and stuff original native languages yeah yeah that's fair i i i kind of had thought that too is it's like maybe maybe now common doesn't necessarily mean that everybody speaks it but common is like your common right, right? like maybe now common means like maybe now for an eric cochran common means eric cochran you know what i mean but then that's at that fair, point yeah. it's like okay well then there's no there's no other universal language it, it becomes right it becomes interesting at that point um but you know. But yeah, that's something. But anyway, so this this is the original Monster Manual stat block uh, because they were not reintroduced in Monsters of Multiverse, mm -hmm. which makes sense because I believe Monsters of Multiverse was just like a combination of Tome of Foes and Volo's Guide. Mm -hmm. So I think instead of like having three books to have all the monsters they basically just stuck it down to two decent sex books yeah um i feel like hmm i'm looking at this and mm -hmm. i feel like the armor class is low i think i think from what i'm understanding it's not wearing armor which is interesting about because you would think they would at least have like some leathers or something um because well, right now if they were to wear leather armor their ac would be 14 that right. can they wear leather armor i'm sure you could put leather armor on them that would be but then they wouldn't be able to fly well no it's it's heavy armor i thought that i thought it was medium and heavy well leather's light leather is light yeah i thought leather was considered medium. leather all the way up to studded and then hide is the first medium gotcha okay. but i mean i guess maybe this is implying that they're just wearing wrappings and stuff right which is interesting and the stats Stats are kind of interesting. They're very, like, even. Very, like, yeah, across I mean, the board. They're, like, honestly, like, a decent... Mon like, you know, throw a tribe at them at a couple lower levels. I mean, yeah, honestly, a couple of these, like, if you're, like, you know, level two, like, a couple, like, four of mm -hmm. these could be a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? With that, I mean, plus five to perception is really good, too. Um, yes, because you know, like eyes in the sky. Passive perception. I mean, fifteen passive perception. That's. I mean, it's nothing compared to Volstags, but you know. <laughs> um, fun fact: I did a little bit of math. This is off topic. I did a little bit of math. Um, Volstag at level twenty, with all the stuff he has. Um, if if I were to give you a Sentinel shield, you yeah. would have like a thirty-five passive. That's insane. <laughs> and and then I did another. Uh, another like another mock-up oh, so just give me true sight at that time at that point yeah i i made just a, a level 20 druid just a level 20 druid with mm -hmm. with proficiency and perception but not um the observant right because observant changed things no observant just per just a regular druid with proficiency and perception and a maxed out save at level 20 the passive perception is 20. that's without observant and everything right. so it's like you're already exceeding what most people Anyway, that's just that's to talk crazy. about past perception because full stacks is so fucking high, it makes me laugh. So, okay. So, we talked... I mean, 
they don't have that big of a stat block because they are kind of just like in the sense of a monster kind of a, like a commoner uh, i don't really want to use gnolls i don't really want to use goblins i don't really want to use kobolds mm -hmm. they kind of fit in that thing just i feel like they're much more uncommon to see in that mold exactly yeah um i do like that they have the dive attack that's kind of cool interesting because you could start off like a, a surprise encounter with the dive attack interesting you know i'm surprised this isn't built into the air Conqueror race at all right that would actually make melee builds viable with it hmm interesting so then they have their talent attack which that is built into the race they, they it do is have their talent. but it's built through strength while this seems to be through decks oh yeah i've noticed which is i wish is that's how i wish that's how it was um for the race because that would that the would race. make the talents a little more viable because most of the times you're not most of the time you're not building a strength based Aarakocra and if you are you have better weapons than the talent. Yeah. Right. So if you were to make it with decks, I think that would make it a little bit more likely for people to actually use that ability, but you know. And then it talks about you know the javelin, which I discussed saying that's like their prime weapon is a javelin. Mm-hmm. I mean, because they're light, they're easy to throw. Yeah. They're easy to carry. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to encumber yourself while flying. So I, I I think that that makes a whole hell of a lot of sense to me. I agree. Interesting. That dive attack's really cool. I wish that that was actually... The, I, yeah. I wish that was integrated. I like the dive attack. Unfortunately, it's not. So now... We talk about the playable race. Let's Legacy love it. Edition. So, uh, originally, when Monster, yeah, sorry, when the Air Cocker became a playable race in not Princess Apocalypse, I did kind of fib on that. So, uh, when just fun fact, when Elemental Evil play, Prince of the Apocalypse released, it's also released with a PDF called Elemental Evil Players Compodium, which contained races, uh, Air Cocker, the four Genasi races. Deep Gnomes, and Goliaths. Hmm. So, I thought that was cool. But I'm also like, why isn't that printed in the book? I want the physical copy of it. <laughs> That's just me. Um, I might actually print it off tomorrow at work now that I have it saved. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, in the Legacy, they got a plus two to Dex and a plus one to Wisdom. Which we know going forward, races will not give benefits like that. You'll just kind of be able to pick and choose. Which is... Yeah, I don't want to say it's controversial, but it is a topic people have discussed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you have the size of medium. Which is, I think, pretty much what every... Uh, playable character races. Everything except gnomes, halflings, and I think I think gnomes and halflings are the only ones that are considered small. small. Oh, and grung. Grung, yeah. That's about it, though. Yeah. Uh, then you have, so th they're about five foot tall, eighty to a hundred pounds. So they're actually kind of short. Like, I don't expect them to be average height of five foot yeah they're not they're not giants um which is no. hilarious and that plays into another part of my character but yeah they're they're not huge by any means they're not big yeah like I, most people in the world are taller than what they could be at a max so then you have speed of 25 feet uh which is actually less than most races but i think that was to help balance the fact that they have 50 flying feet yeah because most i mean realistically speaking like what eric cocker is going to walk when you can fly, you know what I mean. Like, right. like if I yeah. could fly, I would never walk again. Like I'm just, like I'm just being real. You know what I mean? So yeah, there, there, there's the talons, which is plus the strength modifier. So weird. And then they speak common Eric Cochran and Arn, 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 as we mentioned earlier. So this is uh what we would normally be like yeah this is what you do but thanks to Mordenkainen's uh going forward this is 
legacy information. To be fair, you can still play it however you want. Yo, like yes, one hundred percent. Like honestly, like so, and it's usually it's up to the DM, right? Most of the time, um, obviously, right? It even says, if you're you know you we're skipping a little bit at the bottom, it says a language you and your DM agree upon. Whatever your DM mm-hmm. rules uh, goes, you know. If your DM decides, you know, to to continue playing with legacy. You know what? That's why you, that's why you talk to the DM about what their you know right. rules are because I know some DMs like to stick to legacy and I know that some um, like the new the new way of going about things, which is that every character can be every class uh, and its viability in terms of ability scores. Because I know that some you know some features on some races don't like merge well, right? Like I'm right. trying to think like for example, the centaur has like a a, a hoof ability. But it requires that you make a melee attack. So, right, you're not going to use that ability if you're a wizard centaur, right? You're right. not going to use that ability often, but because of how the new stats work, you still get to increase your intelligence by two and something else by one if you're a wizard and a centaur, you know? So, uh, yeah. like, for instance, my DM for this game that I'm playing in Eric Cochran chose to use this. Uh, oh, which, wait, so, the legacy or the... To use the... What is this? The, the new, What are they calling the new stuff? Is it, I, I don't know. I think it's just... It's just new stuff? New stuff. Well, yeah. uh, my DM's using the new stuff, so I have uh, the experience in this, but I also, when I built the NPC known as Juniper, I have all the stats in the old stuff, so it's kind of interesting right. to see. Um, but, like, yeah, you know, for instance, going like, for instance, when we made Volstag, we did use the, the half-orc stats that were previously in place, which is, like, two to strength and one to con. Um... Which, which is technically still because half of the the player's handbook races weren't redone yet. Okay, so there you go. Um, if they ever do get redone, obviously this this right. video will now get dated. Scald as a fire genasi has changed. Was. Technically, we haven't. Yes, and I have no intention of like like hey guys, the rules change, so your characters are going to change up. No, it's just that's the way that I right. That's the way we made them. We'll stick by it, and then. If, you know, a Double Advantage Season 2 ever rolls around, we'll, you know, talk about how we want to go about it. I kind of am par- I'm kind of partial to the old rules. Um, because I, I do like how, you know, the races have specific, you know, strengths and weaknesses, right? It makes sense for a person who is of half-orc descent to have a little bit of a buffier build and a, and a hardier constitution. Um, while it wasn't, you know, it wasn't optimal for Volstagg's build, right? Of course, a plus two to Wisdom would have helped you a lot in the early game. Right. But, like, you know... Volstag has 20 wisdom now, so it doesn't necessarily matter too much. Uh, so I guess it's just kind of... It's up to interpretation. But uh, you get a lot more shit with this. Uh, that's for sure. Yes. And, okay, so... This playable race, as it is now, is from Morton Uh Uh, like we said, we talked about the determining your character ability stories increase 1 by 2, increase different 1 by 1, or increase 3 by 1. Uh, that, I said, you know, originally when we talked about Volstagg, that his, you know, half works haven't been updated. But technically, this is the optional rule. Yeah, you can sub from it in. Tasha's. You can sub it in. Yes. Um, Which, and when we first started playing, Tasha's had just, like, released. I think barely. If, if that. Yeah. I think maybe. Well, let's see. Because we. We were reminiscing before this episode. Um, yes, yes, we were. Very much so, and it was a good time. But let's see. Tasha's D&D release. Because we began talking about Double Advantage's concept in um, in February of 21. Right. So let's see. I think Tasha's, Tasha's came out, come out in wait, guess, March of 21? November 17th of 2020. So wow. Tasha's was already out, but I don't oh. think... I don't think we even talked, like, weirdly enough, I don't think we ever talked about Tasha's. Maybe because... I either, well, I had no idea what it was. <laughs> that's that's true. At that point, you didn't even know what D&D was, more or less. Um, right. I think, low-key, um, I didn't bother with Tasha's, one, because at the time, I also wasn't, like, super... Like, I was just... I was into the D&D that I had learned, which Tasha's was nowhere near right, around yeah. when I started. And I think also with Tasha's, they, they were adding all these optional rules, and I wasn't trying to teach new players, okay, here are the rules, but here are the new rules that are optional. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think I wanted to bother and with that. here's optional stuff, and blah, blah, blah. 
which uh, we we've kind of incorporated Tasha's in. Yeah, it's some of the things that um, I like, I, I've pulled in from Tasha's. Yeah, um, like the uh, the well. To be fair, if I'm gonna, if I if I may, the only reason I really brought in some of the optional Tasha stuff was because of um, Tsunami needing to leave for a little bit, right. which in turn need, Scald needed to, to take some time off, which left the group without someone with Revivify. And the Tasha... Yeah, without a healer. Yeah, yeah, basically without a healer. And Tasha's optional spell list provided Druids with Revivify, which to me makes a lot of sense. And yeah. it added a lot of good spells that just made sense. And so I was like, well, if there was any time and to... Now I have Fire Shield and that thing is amazing. And now I regret it. Um, yeah. But, you know... <laughs> it's like, I did it and now I hate yeah. you for it. <laughs> it's, it's cool, though. It's a good spell. But, like, the thing, too, is it's like... Excuse me. It just goes to show that, like, if new stuff releases and you as a group decide... And we talked about it, too. There was, there mm -hmm. was a time where, like, I think even both you and I were like, maybe not. You know, maybe, maybe we just play that risk. And right, we had right. conversations about it. And that's when you have conversations with your DM about, well, hey, this new thing just released. How do we all feel about it? Um, like there's some there's some new stuff with the druid that we like never talk about, like the cantrip versatility that exists yeah. that we never really worry about because you don't really ever use cantrips, so it doesn't matter. Um, Literally, the only time I use cantrips is to like just druid craft to show off. That's yeah, that's it. That's it. But like, <laughs> like there's some rogue stuff that like is a little OP, and so like. You know, talking with Torchic, we're like, let's just kind of keep it and let's keep it the way it is. Sakado doesn't need to be anymore. Okay? Exactly. So, like, like I said, if a double advantage season two comes around, then there will be more things to talk about. Like, okay, how do we want to rule about this? And right. by the time that rolls around, D and D one may be a thing, like officially. And so it. Right. I think it's what two years out or three years. Which out? we very well play. We very well. We very well may play this game for two more years, maybe even five more years, depending on how people feel about yeah have their characters and and how they're you know feeling. But like, as long as you don't kill us, I'm not gonna kill you. I can't kill I you. I was. I can't kill I you. I was writing a new character. <laughs> Were you really? I was thinking. I'm like, one of us is dying here. That's funny. That's my. That episode will be out sometime, and you guys have to figure out what I was talking. That about. That episode will be up somewhat, sometime. I don't fucking know, because at this point we're so yeah. far ahead. I feel like I can't. Yeah. Uh, anyway, back to the fucking race because we're very off tangent. Yes. Here. All this to say we that been... all this to say that just talk to DM, whatever they want, because you know you never know. So I will say when it, you get down to the other stuff besides the you know not getting your uh, ability increases, I prefer this one. I do too because you get the thirty walking feet. Mm -hmm. And then you have flying speed equal to your walking speed, which, which is a big nerf. But it's from 50. but flight is so op. Yes. It's so op. Um, I and, I feel bad about it sometimes when I use it. Right. But I know a lot of people were happy that the Eric Cocker got this race because it meant people were going to be allowed to play it. Because this is probably the most banned race next to Yunti. Which is insane because it's just it's just the flight. It's just the flight. Yeah. But Fifi I Okay. Uh I believe in double advantage it is known I can wild shape into flying creatures now. Yes, at this point it is known. Flying is OP. <laughs> it's very OP, right? But to be fair, right? This is you're starting with this. If you're starting at level one, you start with this. <clears throat> yes, that's what I mean. Most creatures unless you have you know the, the boots of flying or whatever like spell casters don't get access to fly until level five right mm -hmm. druids don't get access to fly until level eight as wild shape right so you're starting off with this and i could see why most people like well that's just circle of the moon druids no everybody gets to fly at eight. Oh, is that one it's just oh, it's okay. just you have a, a lot more at your arsenal oh i can yeah i can i can turn into better flyers at and like on like honestly like even at level eight like at this point right they're, they're strong they got all this stuff like Flight is really fucking annoying, right? Because most things don't have a way to handle it unless you're also throwing flying creatures at, at them, right? So, right. like, and I'm not I'm not saying, like, oh, all flight's bad, right? Because it's like, flight really saved your ass when you were having a really rough time, you know, in that episode. But flight at level one is very, very OP. Yes, so I understand yes, yes. it. I wouldn't go out of my way to ban it. 
Um, but like, right. let's say one of you guys wants to play an Arakakura in the future, um, you know, at level one, I would just keep that in mind and make sure to have things that not punish you for flying, but things that either make flying, hurt you for flying yeah, that yeah. either make flying harder or make it, you know, oh, if you fly, it's actually it might actually harm you somehow or make you think right. a little bit more about flying and, and specifically maybe throw a little bit more creatures who can fly right there's low level creatures that can fly you know right. that you can fight i also against. think in the past or like had i run a campaign and someone wanted to play an air conqueror before this was up i would have allowed it and i think one good way to get around like the 50 fly speed but like the first major thing in a cave yeah that yeah somewhere where flying is just going to be worthless yeah and that's the, it, oh you fly up and you hit your head because yeah. the ceiling's 10 feet high some people would be like well that's that's punishing your player for playing but in all honesty right no. like it's just it's balance. it's balancing right because yeah let's say you know you spend like five sessions in a cave and then the next you know 10 sessions are outside you know what i mean and right another yeah. character's flying and you know you throw a bunch of you know imps or something and like now there's like an aerial combat going on as well as a combat on the ground which is an interesting cool yeah. thing to you know it, it's not it's not punishing it's trying to keep things in a nice rotation that way like the other players are like he always gets around things because he's flying and so like you know it's, a, it's an interesting little thing um, but yeah I, I think the nerf was was very helpful right uh, now they did get a buff the talents well, kind of two buffs the talents it now does a d6. But it's still the strength mod, and most of the time you're not going to run straight. Yeah. It's interesting. It's fair. So, but I mean, it's still I mean, a good utility in case, like, you get unarmed. You know, you can never really be unarmed because you have those. Uh, Aarakocker Barbarian's kind of dope. Yeah. And to be fair, an, an Aarakocker Monk isn't too terrible because now, like, you can get also, past yeah. you can get past the bludgeoning. If, you know, if something's resistant yeah. to bludgeoning, you can go with piercing instead. Or slashing. Yep. Slashing. Slashing, yeah. Um, it is funny though, because technically the base monster, Aarakocra, still does only 1d4, because it was not updated. In but at least it uses games. dex. That's also true, yeah. So you're kind of evening it out, evening out the, um, the damage output. Hmm. It's funny. Uh, wind uh, color. Wind yes, color. this is the big the big change the second big change the flying speed is the biggest change but i've noticed that with the fact with mordenkainen's sorry to cut you off um no, the thing i noticed with mordenkainen's is a lot of races got spells yeah weirdly enough which i think i feel like windcaller definitely calls back to elemental evil mm -hmm. um do i have that one a little excerpt uh sequestered in the high mountaintops blah 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 oh they hail from the world beyond yes because they are from the elemental plane of air mm -hmm. which i didn't mention that in origin and history but that's because i wanted to mention it here because it plays more into this you know into the wind color nature spell. yeah yeah um so the interesting thing about this is that the spell itself uh, is a second level spell, which is very interesting that, you know, a, a free second level spell is nothing to scoff at, um, especially if you're not a caster, uh, right. you know, because you just get free spell. But uh, the spell itself is very underwhelming. Um, Gust of Wind is, is, it's kind of bad. Yeah, I mean, it's like... It's kind of bad. Um, there's a lot you could do with it, and it's obviously very... Um, situational but most of the time if you're a caster you're probably not going to use this because it's concentration and like like as a fighter you may pop this shit off all the fucking time because you got nothing else to really concentrate on but I, and I think people talked about that it's like this is actually kind of nice for non spell casting classes because they now can you know they have a spell that they can do a little bit. Can't do a lot with it, like yeah. you said. But 
but it, it's still interesting. Like for a rogue or for you know, barbarian and rage, it may become like an issue. But like, yeah. yeah. But like, at least in my particular instance, I'm a arrow cocker druid. I I very rarely let this spell loose um, because there's much better options. So, but it's it's nice utility yeah, as, to have as a caster class. I think as a ranger, this would be very interesting to work with, um, because as a ranger, you don't get second level spells till later. Uh, right, but are you really gonna cast this over Hunter's Mark? Well, I mean, after oh wait, Hunter's Mark's concentration, so yeah, concentration, you, you, yeah. you're never really gonna cast this. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless like you're in a situation where like Hunter's Mark may not become viable, like if like to push somebody off an edge, this is very this would probably come into mind first rather than oh i'm gonna hunter's mark that be like well let me try to push this guy off the edge of a cliff and then if he lives (laughs) then i'll then i'll cast hunter's mark then i'll hunter's mark so it's 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 interesting you know it's it's a fun little a fun little thing um but it's nothing it's not op by any means right right they could have given it like you know wind wall or some shit yeah something like crazy like that so but okay, so you know that's the race as uh, bare bones. Obviously, can't. I feel like when you're discussing like races, we're not here to tell you how you should play this race. We're just here to kind of discuss what it is. Mm-hmm. So I believe that brings us to your DM corner, which, in an interesting change of fate, is actually kind of a player corner uh, yes. a little bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll dip into the DM aspect first. Um, I love this race a whole hell of a lot. Um, I had always wanted to play one, and I had always wanted to in, like integrate them into a world. And so I did very early on, in the very early yes. episodes of Double Advantage, the first mission, the, blah, 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 the first mission for the at the time unnamed Lightbreakers was to rescue a young Aarakocra. Um We were the Lightbreakers then. We just didn't know. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, and they they were successful, and they saved her as well as her mother. Her name was Juniper. She was a hummingbird aracocra. Um, weirdly enough, had I believe purple feathers on the front, if I remember that correctly. I think uh, so, because yeah. there was a specific uh, bird that lived in the mountains, and she was a bird who was trapped in the mountains. And I just thought it was fitting. I'm not. I don't remember, but it was a hummingbird. I'm sure if somebody in the comments looked it up it would be pretty easy to figure out what word i used for reference um but i um i wanted that to be an npc and i i i made her a a cleric of the wild mother which in turn became eventually became very important uh, um weirdly enough um and depending on when this goes up you guys may know that she made a little return cameo um so this should go up uh fourth wall break but 25th of November? It'll probably be up by then, so this isn't a spoiler. Yeah. Um, but she does make a, a quick little return. And, um, yeah, you know, I was like, well, I want her to be a cleric. I want to, you know, I want it to be kind of like a, you know, I wanted to give her a reason for being where she was and being a cleric made the most sense and, you know, played that out. And, you know, it was it was nice. And then I didn't put Eric Cockers in the world again. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like... I mean, I feel like that's literally the only Aarakocra we've that's seen. That's the only Aarakocra you've seen and met. They exist. I just never... Right? I just... To me, the way that I DM it, it's, it's a little odd, but I like to have, like, one notable PC of each race and right. of each class um, just just because it's fun, right? Like, um, you know, Aarakocra... Well, yeah, because it gives you a chance to kind of play that class should you something happened and i think at the time i, I kind of like okay that that was my eric cocker fill okay i'll move on and then yeah. uh the next you know notable pc that made its way into existence was buksabi who was a tabaxi and tabaxi. um what didn't have a class um and doesn't have a class technically That's right um you know and that was just a standard npc because i know a lot of people i i'm a person who likes to make npcs with classes because i think that's fun because it gives them it helps with personality i think Right. Um, right, because with with Juniper, you know, I I wanted to have a kind of this like this sm- like slight wisdom in a young person and and kind of play into that, which also leads into my character, 
uh, in the game that I'm playing. But, but yeah, so if you want to use this as DM, right, uh, NPCs are great. Monsters, if you can find a way to go about it, to me, I, I don't see them as a fightable creature unless you kind of fuck with a tribe. Um, I was going to say, like... And I mean... Elements... Oh, yeah. Prince of the Apocalypse... They do appear in here as fightable things. Um, I looked into it, and it's it, it is kind of like that. Like, oh hey, there's a couple of them, you know. Yeah. Just kind of like thugs, or you're in because they're kind of territorial. Yeah. Type thing. Let me see if I can find that first. But yeah, I mean, I'll throw it out there because yeah. I do every fucking time. Eric Cocker Colt. Uh, you could probably find a way. Colt to, of the Eric You could probably figure it yep. out. Maybe uh, maybe some Eric Cocker want to go back to the elemental plane of air. And they're trying Ooh, to open a yeah. portal, and maybe you help them get there, and they give you a reward. Or maybe they their intent is evil, and you try to stop them. Or maybe they open it up, and they don't understand that by opening it up, they unleash something that they shouldn't have. And so they're kind of innocent. I was about to also... say, they... it'd be cool, like, got my mind spinning, and I can imagine, like, they've built a big-ass portal, and they're trying to bring, you know, come home, and you're like, but you have, like, some sort of knowledge, and you're like characters do and they're like no you can't do this uh if you open this portal you'll release something and they open the portal and then boom like this giant air elemental comes out and you have to fight an air elemental yeah or maybe maybe you get sucked into the air it. Ooh, yeah. because you know the elemental plane of air is known for be i mean it's like we talked we've talked about the elemental right? plane yeah. of fire on this channel um and how it's just fucking hot fire everywhere yeah. right <laughs> Who's to say that the elemental plane of air is not just fucking humongous gusts of wind and tornadoes, and it just the second it opens, it pulls you right in, you know, uh, because of how crazy the air is, uh, and then that can, you know, a whole a, a whole thing that leads into that and stuff like that could be really interesting. But you know, as a player uh, playing this race, yeah. I've been playing this race for a couple of weeks now, probably like five or six, um, and um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, flight is very abusable. I try not to abuse it too much, um, because all you really have to do is fly 10 feet up and nothing can hit you melee, um, right. which for my DM is an easy counter, just give a creature bow and arrow or spells and suddenly now I yeah. now I have eyes on me, right? It's easier for that. Um, but I don't fly, you know, I don't use all my movement to go 30 feet up, I just, I like to keep it a mile 10 feet up because then I'm out of melee, but I can still be hit um, and it keeps things balanced. Um, and I'm a druid, so I have all the spells and a gust of wind is thematic for the druid nature um i've used it a couple of times do druids get that they do get gust of wind so it's pretty redundant i was gonna say i was like wait don't i have uh, that <laughs> it's a free use which is fun um you know right. it makes things interesting um but yeah it you know um i i really have found myself playing into more than i thought playing into the naivete that uh living in a society that's kind of secluded would provide, right? Like living in a, in a nested kind of community and, and being only with people of your kind and how that can lead to like a very closed mind type of mindset. Um, but also I have found myself playing into the age span that Aarakocras have. Um, they only live to be 30. And so there's this mentality of trying to do the most before you die, which is kind of fucked up. Huh. Um, but like it's a you know you're basically born and don't have that much time as many other people especially in a world where dwarves live for 700 years you know you're practically your life is practically inconsequential um, like you know what I mean like what effect can you do in 30 years when some people have live for 700 um, and so I think that that could be an interesting topic to tackle as a DM right um, you know I, I've as a player, I've yet you it pick a druid. <laughs> That's the funny part, is that yeah, my uh, well, I mean, I won't get that for a while, but my 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 character doesn't know that that's what's going to happen. Right. My character is not aware but... of the fact that eventually he will live longer yeah. than many of his people, which Wait, that is that's at level seven. No, that's way later in the game. 18, 18 I think. But that's an interesting that's dynamic insane. because it's like now I'll live, right? Let's see. It's it's 10 for every. So instead of living 30 years, I'll live 300 years. And that's that's me living through multiple lifespans of my people. 
Yeah, like, which is kind of crazy. Like, I'll live through about. 10 generations of my own people. And I will still die before dwarves and elves. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I will be the oldest Aarakocra ever and still die before... Yeah one of the youngest dwarves. And I will still die. Yeah, I'll like I'll I'll be 300 years old and meet a 100-year-old dwarf and he will I will still die before him. You know, it that's the funny thing and it's like yep. now and it's interesting cuz right now I'm playing the fact of I will die before many of my companions, right? Mm-hmm. And na- and then eventually if the game goes long enough, the struggle will be I will outlive 10 generations of my own people. And now, yeah, and now there's a, in, I, there's a built-in like complexity there that I think would be very interesting to play into. Um, not just you know for you know druids, but the Aarakocra lifespan. Of, you know, a monk Aarakocra gets the same type of thing. Um, monks get like diamond soul or whatever, which and like oh, and yeah. like timeless I was body, about that. which basically is the same, right? A, an Aarakocra monk will live that long, and maybe, you know, maybe you you go to a, a temple of Aarakocra who are trying to open up a portal and, you know, maybe the failures of that lead into dynamics and then you talk to somebody who's like, I'm going to outlive everybody in this temple. Um, and and you, the, the repercussions of that. I know some people don't play D&D to tackle hard, heavy-hitting subjects, but I love that shit. Um, right. Because I think that it's the one place where you can tackle some things that you, you can't. Like, we as human beings cannot tackle that. That's not something that we will ever struggle with, at least for now, until technology proves otherwise, right? But, like, I will never have to think, like, hmm, I will outlive my children by 100 or 200 years. years. You know what I mean? That's just not possible right now, right? And so, yeah, it's kind of... It's never possible. Yeah. It's an existential thing, which is weird, right? It's an existential yeah. thing, but it doesn't exist, right? Like, right. the idea of living... Uh, outliving 10 generations of people is impossible but when you think about it it is like wow that is really fucking scary and i know some people just like to play D to kill shit and have a good time and, and cast cool spells but like some people love to tell stories and i think that one of the best stories is tackling things that we can't tackle in real life right um and i mean that's why one of the reasons i like it is because you know what I mean? You get to tell a story. You don't just get to tell someone's story. You get to tell your own story. You get to tell your own story with your friends, and mm-hmm. everyone has equal part in it. I mean, well, to be fair, everyone has equal part in the sense that everybody plays a part, but, like, there's still some things that I am in control of in terms of your oh, yeah. your backstory, right? You're learning things that you didn't know. You're learning things that you did know, but your character didn't know, which is one of my favorite things, is when, yes. like... You like you've written your backstory for Volstag pretty much to the full, and you're just now learning some of those things, even though you wrote them, right? Yeah, but it's because but that's kind he of like how know. I wanted. I wanted, I wanted a character that had some mystery, but not like unknown mystery. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting, right? Because it's like there is stuff that you wrote that Volstagg knows. There is stuff mm-hmm. that you wrote that Volstagg doesn't know. So it's, it's an interesting thing because it's like, you know it, but you don't. So like, if it when you find out, you won't be surprised, but Volstagg is, which is interesting. And then there's stuff that you didn't write that I wrote. Right. I feel like when I wrote the backstory, I wanted to give you pieces of a puzzle, but no image of what that puzzle looked like. Exactly. So you put the pieces in how you want. Them. You gave me pieces and said, put it together. Yep. And you know half of what it looks like, but the other half is 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 up to me. And that's right. That to some DMs is terrifying uh, because <laughs> that's more work for them. But to others and many like me, I had faith. Many like me love that shit because you are giving me control just something that i love i love being and it's not like oh i'm gonna fuck this dude's backstory up it's like a now can't it's like a challenge now can i make everything make sense can i make everything make sense and only i will find that out when all the pieces are laid out then i'll finally know did i do that correctly um 
And so this kind of turned into like a how to play D and D a little bit. Um, and I've and I've always wanted to. It's the player corner. Yeah, I've always wanted to do a little show somewhere, anywhere. It doesn't matter which channel. I don't really mind. Of kind of just talking about like stuff like this, where like right. you know how not how to play the game by any means, and not like not like what's the best way to be a DM, what's the best way to be a player, but like some of the things that I've learned throughout my time. You know, not just from watching other shows and playing myself, but learning from I mean, you guys have taught me so much about what to do and what not to do, uh, especially with Sakura, because fuck that guy. Um, <laughs> you know, and things that I won't ever do again, like dexterity saving throws. You never see those again. Um, you know what I mean? But like, stuff like that. Just like these small little things of like, like you said, I think you worded it perfectly. Like, you gave me the pieces without knowing what the full puzzle looked like. And I think that's a really great way of explaining how D&D is is that mm. D&D is just a bunch of pieces that you play out and you put them together piece by piece session to session and eventually once it's all over you get a picture and it was a picture that when you started you didn't know what the picture would look like right? With Volstagg right. you started off as a person whose name literally he dubbed himself the Forgotten and now yeah. is in possession of one of one of the world's most powerful artifacts and is in service of a god right like would you have seen that no right and that's what's fun i was harking back to employed by a guard yeah yeah fucking torchic see that that's the thing he does he puts that shit in our heads um but you know what i mean like a- like who would have thought right like who would have seen sakuro in the position that he is now right and it's, it's exact. And who knows what thirty more episodes would do, right? And so I think that that's kind of just the fun part about all this bullshit that we do is that we just sit down, we play, yeah, we, we, we play as imaginary bird people, <laughs> you know what I mean, and tackle yeah. the hard-hitting subjects of outliving ten generations of people. And so, yeah. It's a, this is a fun little race that I, I wanted to, to talk about because I think that it's a perfect example of being able to cover topics that we can't in the real world, which is part of why I love this game. Um, right. There's obviously many other reasons aside from the fact that I get to play a fucking bird. Um, that's cool as shit. <laughs> uh, and I'm a male bird, so I have very colorful purple feathers. Um, and it is based on the violet back starling, which is a bird that does have beautifully okay. purple uh, feathers. If you guys want to look that up at home, or maybe Bryce puts it up uh, in editing or whatever. Um, but yeah. it's a beautiful bird, and I base my character off of that because he's a stars druid. He loves space, and whenever I think of space, I think of purple. Oh, that's right. You are a stars druid. And um, I actually... This is perfect. I have my purple lights on in the background. There you go. And I, I actually built the character. The, it, this, this could be a whole. This could be a whole episode of a podcast in and of itself. But I'll, I'll keep it quick. Uh, for my birthday, one of my friends gave me a set of purple kind of. They're like clear dice with wisps of purple in them. And oh yeah, I think I've seen. And those. to me, it reminded me of space dust. And I remember one day I was sitting down and I was fucking with. You guys probably remember it. It's like called like boat something or whatever. It's an AI art generator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was fucking around with it, and at one point, I was screwing with, like, space stuff, and it was making a bunch of cool space art. And then at one point, um, it had made, like, a bird. Like, one of the clouds, like, looked like a bird to me. I don't think it Mm -hmm. intended for it to. It just looked like a bird to me. And then I went with space bird, and it started making all these beautiful, like, space birds. And I was like, you know what? And And I looked at my dice, and I was like, this is... I'm going to do something with this. And when I got the chance to be a player again, I was like, okay, I'm using these dice. I'm using this space bird. How do I do it? And I was like, okay, Aarakocra, Stars Druid. And that was it. And Yeah, that's like perfect. And it's perfect. And when he, when he activates his starry form, it's basically just this bird that changes to purple and looks like it's a bird made of space dust, which hmm. is cool. Our druids just awesome. It, druids are the best. Fucking, we should, we should play Oops All Druids in the next campaign. <laughs> Oops All Druids, yeah. Because and it plays so different because I right. I'm I'm mostly a spellcaster in this instance. So it, it's it's definitely um, intriguing. It's gonna be great. Campaign two is gonna come around. Everybody's gonna be like, yeah, I'm a 
half elf paladin now, and I'm a Goliath monk. And I'll be like, yeah, um, I'm a half orc druid again. <laughs> Roll it back. Uh, <laughs> and and honestly, like you, that's the cool thing about this game is that, and everybody's always like, fucking human fighters, the most basic shit in the world. And it's like, well, there's so much you could do because you could you could play yeah. another half orc druid, and it would be the entire it would be an absolutely different oh. character. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to pick Circle of the Moon. I could pick anything else. Yeah. Uh, what's the weird, creepy... Oh, no, that's that's the ranger. That's the swarm keeper. Well, there's the spores druid, which is also really creepy. Yeah. But it's also one of the best... Um, one of the best circles in the game, uh, arguably. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it, there's a lot you could do. Um, and so, we definitely went on a lot of tangents here. Well, I went on a lot of tangents we did. here. Yeah, uh, I think we do that. And like every episode, we'll be like, "Hey, this is what we're talking about," but we're actually just gonna end up talking about something yeah, completely no. different, and then mention what we're supposed to be talking about. At this point, bro, it's not even the monster corner. Like, I feel like, like, uh, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like at this point, we are, we have been like for the last couple episodes, we're doing a show within a show. Like, right, literally, like, it's like this is what we're gonna kind of touch on, but that's kind of how podcasts are, aren't they? It's like this is what our main topic is, but it's gonna lead to other topics. Yeah, I mean, the only problem here is that. It, like we this is the monster corners where we pride ourselves in talking about the monsters and stuff and so we we do we do we we do do. but i think that sometimes we uh we stray Uh, a little far from the light so to speak um that's it which i think is hilarious (laughs) and i mean hey if you guys like it maybe we'll uh we'll make another side show where we just talk about um you know our D D experiences in the world we could call it the double advantage podcast well, I think we already had a double English <laughs> podcast, um, but I, uh, I don't know. I was thinking about like a double advantage after show type of thing at some point uh, that we could yeah. maybe get devil advantage late night. Late night. I kind of like that. <laughs> I kind of like that. Well, we'll see. Like it, it may devil come to fruition after dark. After dark is well, <laughs> but then I'd feel bad because there's the tox machina after dark. So like, yeah. But what, what do they do for Jack in the Box? It's like Jack in the Box late night or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Let me see. Jack in the Box. It was, uh, I think like After Dark and Late Night are just like the two most basic things to slap on a late night talk show. Yeah, it's literally Jack in the Box late night. Yeah. What what the fuck is all the shit that they do? Like the late night talk show, TV shows. There's like the late show. Oh, the yeah. Late, late show, the late show. The tonight show. Yeah, fucking... Yeah. We can, we can literally call it like double advantage fucking fucking moon moon time and it would fucking have the same effect. You know what I mean? Like double advantage circle of the moon. That's actually <laughs> We're going to get back to you guys. <laughs> Cuz this uh, this old boy is uh, is cranking out some fucking ideas in his noggin that's like really getting him excited right now. Uh, and I'm speaking <laughs> about myself in the third first person and that's how you know things are getting bad and late. It's getting a little late, but uh, I think that is gonna wrap this one up, everybody. We are so happy to have you. Uh, sorry, we went on some tangents here. Try and hone it down in the next one, which will be next month. Uh, I've got some ideas rolling around in my head um, for monsters, but if you guys have a winter themed monster, you know, something icy, snow. Something to fit, you know, the kind of Christmas snowy, cold vibe. Go ahead and leave it in the comments down below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe to myself and the Devil Advantage channel. Links in the description below. Wait a minute. Have we been doing this for a year? Because, yeah. Because didn't we do Edder Caps? Uh, yeah. No, we did, uh, Red Caps. Red Caps. What the fuck are Edder Caps? I. Uh, they're like a bug-looking thing. I'm tripping. Yeah, I was gonna say, haven't didn't we do a fucking a Christmas episode? Yeah, we, we did. We did. We did red caps, like the evil blood elves. Yeah. What the hell is an cap? Oh, this is terrifying. It's like a bug. Ew. Yeah, what the it's, fuck? It's, it's like a gross bug thing. Get me right? out of here. <laughs> Ender caps coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, any last words, Grab? Sorry for the tangents, guys. Uh, I'll. I promise we'll tone it down. Either we'll tone it down or we'll move it somewhere else. 
We'll figure it out. Or we'll just keep doing what or we're we'll doing. keep doing it and fuck the haters. <laughs> you guys love it. We know you do. And we love you. Yep. All right. We will catch everybody later. Peace.